Well, I suppose I might as well get started. People can roll in as they see fit. <clears throat> I'd like to begin this lecture on the nature of fate, as is appropriate to this topic, with a reciting of a hymn to Almighty Zeus, King of all gods and of all men. Let's take a moment for breath. O oh, Jove, much honored Jove, Zeus supremely great to thee, our holy rites we consecrate, our prayers and expiations, King divine, for all things round thy head exalted shine. The king, the earth is thine, the mountain swelling high, the sea profound and all within the sky. Saturnian king descending from above, magnanimous commanding sceptered Jove, all parent, principle, and end of all things his power almighty shakes this earthly ball. Even nature trembles at thy mighty nod, loud sounding, armed with lightning that thunder. God, source of abundance, purifying king, O oh, various form from whom all nature springs, proprietus, hear my prayer. Give blameless health with peace divine and necessary wealth. Well, with that said, let us hope that the almighty gods have heard our prayer and watch over us this day and all days forward. Let us begin. This will, I hope, be the first part of a multi-part lecture on the exploration of the nature of fate from a philosophic perspective, ideally from that of a mostly neoplatonic perspective. But if there seems to be enough feedback, I will most likely begin to delve into other forms of fate if that's if there if there proves to be anything of worth in that regard but for today i'll be mainly looking at plotinus and his conception of fate as established in the third aeneid so the first thing i want to get out of the way is establishing that i am merely the beneficiary and the recipient of a system and a tradition far greater than myself, and that what I speak of here today can hardly be considered my own ideas, and that I defer on this matter, as I do with most matters, to merely the wisdom of those who have come before me. And so I want to make that very clear establishing that in no way can I take credit for these ideas, nor would I care to. With that said, let's get into it. Now, the first thing we have to establish in any conception of fate is we have to lay the groundwork of the very beginning of all existence, as daunting as a task that may be. But we won't get into the specifics of the course of emanation, for that would unfortunately derail the entirety of this conversation, and as such, will be reserved for a later day. Now, as it might be said, we must establish a necessary first assumption that all things are causal save for the one that is the first being who is primeval fit well being is an incorrect word there excuse me it is the first point of existence a vertex from which all lines spring from uh, you'll forgive the euclidean allusions there um, the one is the first necessary being, for it is a being that, as is established in Timaeus, to be a being which is, by its nature, how might we say, which is by its nature always in existence and never becoming, it merely is. Whereas everything else is in a state of becoming, but is not necessarily, I should have said not is, but rather is becoming. Now, having established that there is a series of causations from a first initial being. Oh, I'm, so we, I'm saying that others are beginning to roll in. Well, this will be interesting considering some of the crowd. Now, having established a first necessary being, the one, and we won't go into the nature of being in the one. We'll save that for a different day as I've established. We should establish then from Timaeus 28a4 that there are two classes of beings, as I've said that which always is and has no becoming, and that which is always becoming but never is. Now, the former of that can be grasped by intellection and reason, 
and being able to give a reasoned account, the latter being grasped by opinion and the investigation by sense. And well, uh, epistemology as well may be on the roster for things I might talk about, but again, let's not get into that. Let's merely accept some necessary assumptions for the purpose of conversation. Now that which has become and must be first, and as such, we have no need to trace of its cause. So it has no fate, for it has nothing which precedes its nature. But of those things which come into being, or that which is an, an eternal being, but does not always perform the same action, we must admit a cause to them. Now of those eternal beings, um, the, the class of that nature, we might think of souls, of the divine gods or henads. Um, we might think of those inherent principles, which are very much prior to temporality. Um, but we we do not necessarily concerned with temporality on this moment. But we should but we should be careful to admit to the ranks of eternal beings souls and not just particular souls of human beings but the world soul and the soul of the cosmos we should be carefuler there than we are sometimes in the use of that word but it, it, we'll make that distinction at a later date as well now being souls are not mixed with the world nor does it come into being uh, instead soul is and, and again, soul here is not just the particular mortal soul, but the soul of the cosmos and the soul of the world. It is that which binds all things together as a manner and creates a kind of a harmony. But it can be within a manner of speaking, and you, you'll allow some allegory and illusion here. It is within the body. We should not think of that, of course, as being literally within the body as you know, it's not mixed with the world in any sense or manner, but rather is a kind of an essence or power which has given rise to the body. But for sake of discussion and for sake of thinking, we think of it as being within the body. Now, the soul here is, as a prior establishment, we should understand as a higher principle, it itself is a being which can control the body. Since we're discussing fate here in this day, we must kind of establish then that fate is the particular to a soul. So fate then, according to particular beings which have souls, is derived both of an internal and an external function. Now, when in the case of souls, we might say that the soul is acting involuntarily when it is yielded to the body and it is yielded to external factors such as the revolutions of the heavenly bodies or some external force which we might say has power over the soul. Um, so with that established, we can say then to some extent that fate is mixed. It is both of an ex internal and an external nature to a certain extent. And being as that, fate then is some mixed degree therein. Now, the soul then is voluntary in its action only alone when it is the ruling principle of itself, when it is not yielded any external factors, be it body or be it the heavenly revolutions of the soul. And when it is when it does that, it is being guided alone by the power of reason and the power of intellect. But when it gives way to the desires of the body and to the heavenly cosmos, it slips into errancy and vice rather than being led by reason and wisdom. And in those accounts of action, the nature then of soul is to a certain extent involuntary in its action. That is not to absolve the doer of those things, mind one, of those actions that is, as it is only due to their weakness of nature and their own moral failing that they have allowed their souls to give way and to yield to the desires of the body and to yield to the desire or to the heavenly forces which abound them. So fate then 
is some manner of both, but it does not absolve. But fate, though, is particular to each being. Now, fate then, because it's particular to us, we might ascribe it to certain quality, as hoarseness is to horse. Our fate is to us as those certain qualities. Hmm. I have to say, I think, as an aside, I have to say this is going kind of well, I think. I don't, I've never done really anything like this. <laughs> um, now, I want to be very clear as well, because this distinction can sometimes come up, and I find it to be a kind of funny distinction, where we, we tend to mistake the divine providence with fate. So if fate is an established principle particular to us, and it is not the rule, and that this fate is not the part of some greater entity, as I believe the Stoics establish that one's individual fate in the Stoic metaphysical system is uh, an individual piece of a kind of greater system, but rather is particular and arising from the soul as a factor of its nature being subsumed then in a greater divine providence. So the divine providence, which we tend to kind of colloquially mistake as fate, subsumes these actions, but these actions are still ours. We are free to make them according within, I believe, some level of proportion to our nature. Um, I expect corrections on anything I might misspeak on here today as well, and I would very much appreciate any and all notes as a, as a matter of statement. So what then might we say about the nature of fate is I think it, that's important to kind of get to at some level as well. The nature of providence in relation to the nature of fate. So the nature of providence is in many ways the kind of the unfolding of the world or part of the unfolding of the world. There is not a lone providence, or if there was a lone providence, there would be nothing else, but it's clear that there are other things and that it is not and that it moves towards those things which are other than itself. The divine providence might be thought of as a series of divine laws, but we shouldn't, I think, think of it as a, as a system that's overly legalistic in its existence, but is rather a kind of a guiding course of our existence, a, a model that our souls, by our intellect of reason, might judge its own action. In essence, a kind of subsuming principle that we could align ourselves to. And when we align ourselves to it, we arrive in a kind of harmony with the divine providence, which has been established by the almighty gods. Um, now, Plotinus lays out pretty, I believe in 3.38, 3.28 or 3.29, I believe, that this divine providence establishes, because it subsumes our existence, it establishes the outcome of our fate. That when we act in accordance with the divine providence, being led by our own intellect of reasoning within us to align ourselves to this divine providence, we align ourselves to the good of the world. And when, when we turn away from this, when we allow our intellect of property, when we allow our souls to yield to the material nature of our bodies, to our physical and appetitive desires, we in a manner of course turn to animals, being that humans and all of mankind resides in a kind of a middle position between that of the divine gods and spirits and that of animals. And because we're free to turn to either way, the outcome of which is entirely dependent on us, though the gods grant us a great deal of expediency in the fact that our virtue when we turn to it and we turn to it wholly, and that when we act with that intellect of property in a willing and voluntary manner, this is a far more expedient process than it would be for anything else. Now, one of the things I wanted to point out as well about the nature of providence and the nature of fate, and I wanted to talk exactly here about Emmett's in 3.2.9, and I want to quote directly here, and it is not right that those who are bad should expect others to be their saviors and sacrifice themselves when they offer up prayers. So it is not right 
for them to expect the gods to rule over every aspect of their lives and abandon their own lives, an allegory there, of course, nor even to expect good men who were living a life superior to that of a human rule to be their rulers. This is because they didn't even themselves ever go to the trouble of ensuring that they were good rulers for their fellow for their other fellow men to take care of their well-being while resenting it when anyone becomes good by their own efforts. So the, the consistent establishment that Plotinus lays out with the nature of fate and the nature of how our fate plays out is a is very much a sense of personal responsibility. And I believe this this can sometimes be in contrast, I think, to our our kind of colloquial sense of fate that our fate is deterministic in a kind of absolute sense. So while the divine providence has the ability to subsume our fate, our fate is still, at the end of the day, particular to us. Now, we've established that there are some actions which might be called involuntary and voluntary. And then now it's a good point, and Plotinus himself raises it here in 3.2.10. And as I established at the very beginning of this, for those not here, I am merely the recipient of far greater system of wisdom than myself. These can hardly be considered my own ideas, and I speak merely from the wisdom of Plotinus in these regards, that though that there are involuntary evils which may arise, as we've established by virtue of the soul yielding to matter and yielding to the physical desires of the body, nonetheless, a person is not absolved of those things. The fact, quote, the factor of one's necessity does not imply that an action is caused from outside, but only that it is universally the case. That is to say that one's fate is not necessarily the result of a kind of an outside force causing oneself to do this in a kind of an absolute sense, but that rather soul having yielded to that is what is the cause of this, meaning that at the end of the day, this is – still kind of on you as an individual actor. Now, onto the nature of acting, of course, we've got the very concept of the divine play. As you know, We've kind of often heard how it's described that existence is a play and each person is an actor. And onto that regard, we have to remember that the play isn't deficient in any sense in any regard. Our parts in them, though they are particular to us and arise from us according to our own choices turning voluntarily to goodness being led by intellect of reason or turning away from it and being led by the body we are still actors in a play a play that is in no way deficient and is in no way evil in the, in the kind of colloquial sense of that word but is rather absolutely as it should be so while we are free in our actions to decide our fates our our fates are subsumed as a part of the play, but we are not adding on to that play. Rather, the whole of that play has been in a manner presaged. Now, we can get into some kind of interesting business with that, and I want to save that to a certain extent for some discussion in the future regarding Proclus and Iamblichus, because they've got some very interesting ideas about the nature of the overcoming of fate. Because divine providence and fate and whether or not man is free or not to make his own decisions will continue to come up. And as I kind of said at the beginning of this, if this goes well, I hope to kind of talk about this a few times in other contexts. So what we've said so far is that the nature of fate is particular to each being according to his nature, and that fate is not a part of a divine – is not – an individual piece of some greater part, but is particular to us that is subsumed in a much greater plan, and that this greater plan subsumes these actions, these fates that we all individually have for the purpose of performing and fulfilling a kind of a presaged system that is in no way deficient, so as not to rob the gods of their all-knowingness. That said, I think we should be keen to remember the contingency of our knowing, and that is – and this is getting into Ian Blickus, and we're maybe moving a little bit ahead here, but that we should take 
care to remember that despite this, the, the nature of our knowing is contingent on our being, and that each of us is still limited, divided, and ultimately contingent being who thinks in a discursive, limited, divided, and contingent manner. And as such, we should not think to unravel or uncover the entirety of the divine providence, but merely to seek how our individual piece of that play is meant to resolve itself. And this, I think, can alone be done by the powers of contemplation and by the powers of theurgy. Now, this was kind of meant as an intro, and so I'm terribly sorry if this is cut short, but I believe that I've kind of reached a natural conclusion where I might jump into another part. And so I would thank all of you for being here for this short time, and thank you for allowing me to test my rhetorical skills in a setting to which I am thoroughly unused to. Uh, I hope everyone has a good night, and thank you for being here.